Well, it's good to see everybody today. I don't like what uh, good friends of ours, Ralph and Jean Knopp, are here today. Good to have you guys here with us this morning. We love you so much. And uh, great to have everybody here this morning with you. Amen. Do you feel loved this morning? Yeah. Do you know that God loves you? Yeah. Do you know that we love you? Yeah. Do you know that he's not finished with you just yet? Yeah. Amen. Should I correct that statement? Do you know that he's never finished with you? He's always faithful. I don't want you to put a time. There's not like an expiration date on your salvation. Amen. Your warranty is paid in full. You are, you are a lifetime member of the kingdom of God and of his grace and of his mercy and of his promise and his blessings. Amen. Aren't you so glad that God doesn't run out of his grace or his mercy or his love? You wake up to it and it's new and fresh every morning. Isn't he good? He's good and he's faithful. Amen. Well, if you would join me again in Ephesians. Um, a couple weeks ago when I was here, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32, um, we started a, a sermon and we've been talking so much about finding the will of God. And then a couple weeks ago, in, the, in really in that same vein, that same branch, we started talking about the conversation of our words. And our title for that sermon was, Let Our Words Bear Witness. Let Our Words Bear Witness. What I want to do this morning is I want to kind of go back and recap a little bit of that, but I want to finish the rest of this passage of Scripture, if the Lord God will allow me to do that today. And because really, we started really biting on some strong meat in that moment. Now again, the book of Ephesians is written by Paul. It's written to the churches scattered in the, nation, or in the place of Ephesus. And Paul is writing these passages of Scripture in Ephesus to really be able to help, in a sense, father, continuing the fathering process of churches that he planted on one of his missionary trips. Paul is writing letters back to them to be able to give them guidance and instructions on how they are to live and how they are to treat each other and the expectations. Because this is important. Um, when God began to plant churches through Paul in his apostolic movement as, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, God began to build things, Correct. So when God plants a church, he's actually building something, right? So what, what we mean by that conversation is that when you build something, a foundation, first of all, a footer is laid, and a plot of land, even before that, is, is, is investigated. They go ahead and they lay out the plot of land, and they dig a footer because they know where the building is supposed to go. But there's a constant process of building on top of that footer. Footer is laid, a footer is poured, locks are put on top of that. And then from there, walls begin to be constructed and, and all, all kinds of things starting to happen on top of that. How many of you know that when you were saved in Jesus Christ, you became a child of God? But how many of you recognize that when that happened, God started building something in you? God was building something in you in that very moment. He laid the foundation of Jesus Christ. He laid the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He put the blood of, the, of Jesus Christ upon your life. He called you his own. He sealed you, and he started doing something in your life that you won't look the same as when he got first started. Amen? Isn't that neat to know about that? That if you've been walking with Jesus Christ, you don't look the same today as you did yesterday because God is building something in your life. And he wants it to be able to look like him. It wants, he wants it to be able to sound like him. God is building a purpose in your life. And in part of the connection of what he's building in your life, the people that he's put in your life are also part of the building process. Amen? Those around us can either build us up or they can tear us down. Our situation in other people's lives, we either build them up or we tear them down. Or, unfortunately, there are times when we find ourselves being silent and doing nothing with what God's put inside of us. And so this morning, we're going to continue to talk about Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go back to our illustration, and we're going to see what God unfolds this morning. So join me, if you would, in Ephesians chapter 4, starting really in verse 29. And going through verse 32, Paul says this to the churches at Ephesus. He says this, let no, let nothing, nothing at all, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear it. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Some powerful, meaty scriptures in this context. Um, how many of you know that words build something? Words, words truly build a house. And so as Lisa and I have four kids if you come to our house, our house has certain languages to it. 
There are certain things that we allow to be said and certain things we don't allow to be said. So in our house, swear words are not an option. In our house, we are certainly sarcastic because we have a good time. If you come over for game day, that can be a little bit dangerous, but just know that we love each other. But bottom line is that we build each other up. And so we don't allow people to call each other stupid. We don't allow someone to call somebody ugly or dumb. We don't allow someone to call somebody worthless. Those things are just simply not allowed in my household. Uh, What is allowed, though, is truth. So the word of God, rightly spoken, is always allowed to be spoken in my household. Someone is always allowed to bring a word of encouragement or faith or build somebody up. Somebody is always allowed to be able to speak their heart and to be able to say, I need a word of encouragement today because in my house, as the father of my house, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, by his grace, I'm here to build up my wife. I'm here to build up my children. And so I'm in a building process. Now, as I'm a pastor and have the privilege of being able to do that, I'm here also to build by the Holy Spirit. I'm here to be able to build you up, to build you up in the truth of the Word of God, that you would also be built up in your identity that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so because of that, part of the building process is what you and I interact by what I say to you. Amen? So if I say to you that you're, I'm not even going to say anything negative, but I'm always saying negative things about you, would you feel as though I am building you up or tearing you down? I'd be tearing you down, correct? And so based upon what I say, you begin to receive either life or death because life and death is in the power of the tongue, correct? And so, and Paul was talking about the conversation of how do we interact with other people? Because see, my job as a pastor is not, or even as a father or as a husband, my, not, my job in my family's life and in your life is not to build up in you what I think is best. My job is to build up in you what God is wanting to build in you, amen? Which is always greater than what man could ever think of. Correct? Okay, praise God. So in this conversation with Paul, and talking about this thing, we have to understand that every time that we speak to somebody, we're either building something or we're tearing something down. Correct? So I want to be able to go back to our illustration a couple days ago. As I'm doing that, or a couple weeks ago, as I'm doing that, I want to go back and talk about the conversation of how we define some of these things. So... In Ephesians chapter, and forgive me as I deal with the things going back in the drainage of my throat here. As he says, let no corrupt talk come out of our mind. The Greek word for that is sarpus. The Greek word for that is sarpus. And that truly means that let nothing rotten or putrid come out of my mouth. Let nothing that is decayed or nothing that 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 is foul come forth from my mouth. And again, the conversation of that is that As we speak, the words come from a tree of either life or a tree that has been infected by disease, correct? And so if I'm a child of God, I'm to speak life, which means I'm to be able to produce life to you. And so words that come out of my mouth are much like fruit, is the way to look at that. And the question is, am I distributing to you good fruit that if you eat from it, there's health and life and vitality to it? Or as the moment it comes out of my mouth... Do you recognize that it's rotten and it smells and you want nothing to do with it? Relationship so much is based upon language. Relationship and edifying each other is so much based upon what comes out of my mouth. But the key thing is that we have to understand the source of what comes out of here is truly anchored in what's in here. And that's really important to be able to understand that what's going on in my heart, what's happening in my life in those moments and how I'm interacting with God will really define what's coming out of here. My belief system will define what comes out of my mouth. But a belief system, because of the fact that we're talking not about religion based upon what I do, but we're talking about religion based on relationship with Jesus Christ, that what I say that I think here has got to be connected with the relationship that I find in my heart through the Word of God and through the Son of God that has died and saved and set me free and the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of my life. So, I want to be able to clarify that that in these conversations, what Paul is talking about here is that make sure that you don't give anybody rotten fruit by what you say to them. Because rotten fruit has absolutely no value. And rotten fruit will begin to affect the atmosphere or the culture of the home or the house that you live in. Now, what is so important in this conversation is this, is that just because I believe that I'm called to speak truth And to be able to speak life, that's one person in the midst of a cog of 70 or 80 or 90 or 1,000 people. 
What's really important, what Paul is trying to say here, isn't just what Paul is speaking. Paul is trying to address the tongues of all of the men and women and children inside the body of Christ. Because we cannot leave it up to the pastor to build everybody up, correct? We're all called to build up each other in the Word of God, by the Word of God. Amen? And that is so important because, again, I think, too, that if we want to be able to do the vast service of what God has called us to do, we have to reproduce His heart in the children and people of God. Amen? So for an illustration example, today this is a nail, okay? And this nail is a word. Now, it can either be a word from, that comes from the Word of God, which has got life to it, or it can be a word that comes from someplace else that is not have, does not have life to it. It's negative, possibly. So I brought my little um, six by six back with me this week. And I really enjoyed this analogy a couple weeks ago. And I've really been thinking and praying a lot about this. So if this is you and I, these are people that we're in relationship with, correct? And this, <laughs> this, is, we, this is what happens when we start to speak. And again, the Word of God says, it uses that word to build something up. Because again, God is building something in each one of us. And so therefore, the hammer is the perfect tool to build something, correct? I can drive a nail, I can build a wall, I can build on top of that wall. But the thing to it, whoa, sorry, that is the absolute, yeah, cold medicine this morning. I probably should not be operating heavy equipment <clears throat> when I think about this conversation. But again, this hammer though, okay, it's a tool that is meant for construction, but it can also be used for destruction, correct? So, as I relate with different individuals and we talk together and spend time together, if this is your life, and I come together with you, and all of a sudden I begin to lightly tap a word into your life. So I come and say, I believe that God loves you, I believe that you're beautifully and wonderfully made. And so I put a real word of life into you, okay? And it's important, and again, this is the thing we talked about in church a few weeks ago, that, that sometimes we're great about planning a word of God, but the dangerous part about that is that life will come along and knock it out. Now the problem with this is this. It wasn't the problem that it was planted was the issue. The issue really was, was the fact that it was only planted upon the surface. It just started the process. But it wasn't a part of the actual wood just yet. Does that make sense? This is why parents and grandparents, I don't care how frustrated your kids get at you, when you're always speaking the word of God over them, be faithful to speak it. Be faithful to speak it. Because sometimes there's just hard places in wood. And sometimes if you find a hard spot, it's not that the nail's not supposed to go there. What needs to happen is that it needs to be slower, continual strokes to be able to break down and embed itself into the hard places. And sometimes there are places when we speak and it goes right in. Because see, this is the issue. There's a twofold process here. The wood has to remain soft enough to be able to receive the word. Amen? And so our job in life is that we make sure that we have a soft heart, that our necks don't become stiff, and that we find ourselves teachable. Because I believe the hard places are places of pride. How many of you know somebody that struggles with pride? How many of you know that when someone struggles with pride, it's really hard to tell them something? because they don't want to listen because they think they know best. And that's those places of hardness. So sometimes you'll be able to put a word in there, but it's not going to go anywhere. And sometimes they're going to reject the word, and the nail's going to fly completely off. But that's okay, because all Paul is asking us to do is to be able to speak life, to be faithful to speak it in season and out of season, to be able to speak the truth. So again, as our illustration went, so I started this nail. And sometimes the process of being able to build something up in somebody else's life, I may say a word, and that word goes in. But somebody else may come along, because see, this is the thing. We get too anxious in the middle of the discipleship. We want to drive the nail completely down, don't we? I don't know about you, but I'm not patient, unfortunately. And so I want that nail to be completely embedded. Just get in there, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, I start missing my strokes. Because I'm anxious, and I'm hitting it too fast. I start doing more damage than good. Because all of a sudden, this nail's now out of a line. And so something's got to come back in. Instead of going down, you've got to be able to correct its angle and come back in and start beating it back to a place where it's straight. But because sometimes we're not very patient with each other, and because we sometimes think, well, I told you once, as the farmer said to his wife, I loved you. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. 
How many of you know that's a horrible way to have a relationship with somebody? In the wedding I did yesterday, I was telling the couple that several pieces of advice, and one of the pieces of advice I said is that tell each other that you love them daily and say it slowly. So it's heard. See, this, this, this nail going into here, there's a, there's a culture that's being made. We, we need to understand that this board, this nail, and this hammer were meant for one thing, and that was for this hammer to put this nail in this board. So there's an understood atmosphere here. So when we come together in church, we understand that God is building something, right? And so this is where this gets a little bit touched, and this is where I need to say, Pastor, I love you. Pastor, I love you. <laughs> because sometimes we come into the house of God, what needs to be spoken in truth doesn't always feel good. But if we understand that when we come into the house of God, that our job, it is, it is good to gather together, isn't it? It really is. But part of the whole purpose of coming together is iron sharpens iron, is word transforming lives and truth coming in and, and having an encounter with things that may not always be accurate. And so part of it is making sure that truth goes for us because when truth goes for us, that's the only place the transformation can happen. Amen? You can never have an atmosphere of transformation if truth hasn't come forth someplace. But sometimes truth doesn't always like my flesh. And so when truth comes at me, there's times when I will resist it, I will try to move away from it. But God is so patient to keep it in front of us, amen? Because he knows that, that if he can begin to penetrate this, he can begin to add more nails and build more things in our life. I'm just so glad that he's a patient carpenter. See, Jesus was a carpenter from the beginning for a reason, because he was a builder. He was made to build things, and he's building things in you and I. And what he's building inside of us is the kingdom of God. Amen? And he's also building, though, his identity, which is so important. He's trying to build into you the fact that you are his child, that you are his son, and that you are his daughter. And that is so important. But the issue here is this, is that I've tapped this nail in once a little bit. If I stop tapping at this nail, and I think that I'm done. See, the issue is that this nail, this word, is not embedded in the wood just yet, correct? It still has a place where it could actually be snagged on. And eventually, if it can be snagged on, it can be pulled out. And this is what's happening so much to the world these days. Because, see, we, we don't always know the truth. And because we don't always know the truth, this is how false doctrines get started. And even when a little bit of truth gets anchored, sometimes the false doctrine, because, see, the Word of God says that in the last days men will follow those that will tickle their ears. And ear-tickling teaching isn't transformation teaching. It's a teaching that leads you to a place where the flesh is more pleased than anything else. But we want the Spirit of God to be more pleased in our life. Amen? And so the issue is this, is that because the times are short, we have to be able to teach the Word and make sure that we're shooting at it properly. So for example, if I shoot from too far away, I'll miss the nail. If I shoot too far to the right, I'll miss the nail. I have to be, understand and know the Word of God properly to be able to drive it home properly. If I shoot too far to the left, I'll miss it. If I shoot too far to the front, I'll miss it. But if I am in close proximity, this is why I continue to be able to say to you as your pastor, this is about relationship, not about religion. It's about relationship because I have an intimate moment and I know that I can from here go, boom, I may miss it once. <laughs> and then eventually it'll get struck home. And what's beautiful about this nail and all these cough medicines that I'm on is the fact that it's deep and deeper and deeper and deeper to the point where it becomes a part of the wood. And now I can't separate it from the wood. Now the beautiful part about this, again, is that this is a living thing, right? And so because it's living, it's going to actually grow up around that nail. And that nail is going to become embedded in its very core of who it is. But this is discipleship. 110%. This is what we're called to do when we come together. And let me say this to you. This is the thing that somebody around you probably needs. Somebody sitting to your right or to your left or to your front or to behind you, they're probably needing a word of life today because the enemy would love to build something else in their life. This is already a bent nail, but the enemy would love to, to build a sense of anger, of depression, of hatred, of fear, of corruption. And it, 
it doesn't function. It doesn't really make anything work. Only the word of God is what changes lives. Now, why is this so important? Because again, God is building something in you, correct? Do you ever build something and only put two nails when it deserves six? <laughs> Anybody? And the problem with two nails instead of six is that when wind and pressure go, I have the ability to push that over and unanchor that from the foundation it's been nailed into. And I want you to tell you something, that Satan would love to unanchor you from your foundation. And he will use trials and situations and circumstances, and sometimes even those people around you, to push you out of the things that you're anchored to. And this is why it's so important that you put as much word into people's lives as possible and drive it as deeply as possible because then they're anchored in the truth. Amen? And because from there, God can build even stronger foundations. Now, I want to finish with this last part of this conversation. And we kind of did a lot of this stuff two weeks ago, but I really felt in my spirit it was important to come back and talk about this today. The... Um, Some of us here are very talkative people. Anybody really talkative? Anybody in, in situations just, just loves to talk? Anybody here get uncomfortable when it's quiet? Sometimes. And so because it's, it's quiet, we're going to say something because we want the atmosphere to feel comfortable. You know what I mean? It's like, oh gosh, everybody's really, really quiet. I better say something so that either it'll be funny or lighthearted because we don't want people to be uncomfortable. But there are times when in some of our lives, there are people, though, that around us that were quiet when they should have spoken. And because people are quiet when they should have spoken, what's happening is that we have sometimes missing words in our lives. Remember that conversation we had a couple weeks ago? Because maybe a father didn't speak when maybe he needed to speak, or a husband didn't speak, or a wife didn't speak, or a mother didn't speak, or something like that. We sometimes have missing words of life that God wanted to be able to put inside of us to make us stronger and to build us up. I began to realize a couple of months ago that God was really speaking to me about this conversation of brokenness. And God said to me that brokenness is just a missing place of truth. Brokenness is just an absent place for truth to come in. Because see, sometimes that there's just so many missing pieces. Does that make sense? I think I'm still getting a hold of that as I, as I grow in the Lord a little bit more, but I begin to understand that I'm not broken. I'm not. He saved me and made me whole. The places that I think are really broken are honestly just places where I haven't truly discovered the depth of truth about that situation just yet. And again, this conversation of going back to planting the word deep in our lives, I want to be able to say to you that God didn't save you to leave you broken, amen? The word of God says that he came and he made you a new creation in Jesus Christ. Now this old man is still struggling with some things, but again, I promise you that God has provided all that you possibly need to get over depression, to get over fear, to get over doubt, to get over worry, to get over the craziness that comes at you. God has given you all that you need. What's not, what is not missing is his grace and his faithfulness. But what is missing is truth. Is truth about that situation. Because as I put this in there a little bit harder than I thought I was going to, God wants to nail some stuff down in your life. I love the passage that says he will never leave me nor forsake me. Nail it down. He's perfect in all of his ways. Nail it down. Sorry. <laughs> Again, too much cold medicine. <laughs> he who began a good work in me is faithful to complete it. Amen. Nail it down. His grace is sufficient for me when I'm an idiot. He forgives all of my sins. I mean, you, you, you can go back and, and begin to ask yourself, what part of your belief about God has not been nailed down? Because I promise you there's some things. I got things. We all got things. Being 50 has come a little bit surprising to me. <laughs> I think my birth certificate's wrong, by the way. I'm just kidding. Um, I was surprised to be 50 this year. I knew it was coming. It wasn't like it wasn't coming. But um, I looked at my life thinking, I don't see myself as 50. I can't be 50. And um, I was thinking about the fact of, okay, you know, I'm 50. 
And I thought to myself, am I where I thought I'd be at 50? And I started realizing what a dangerous path that was. Because see, I was starting to compare myself to somebody else's tree. Do you get the analogy? <laughs> and, and I begin to, begin to have the Lord pull me back to, to me and him. And begin to pull me back to the fact that what he's building here isn't what he built here. The past that I have isn't the past that you had. And so I can't compare myself to you. And then, as I really get to think about it, the Lord began to speak to me deeply about the fact that the evaluation of where you are at 50 is completely more about what is inside than what is outside. And I begin to think about that. And I begin to find myself in such a place because the more I focused on what was inside by what God has done, the more I was overwhelmed by his goodness. The more I'm overwhelmed when a $500 car repair bill has been paid in full. And, and I, I begin, to, begin to understand that <laughs> my, my understanding of how good God has been is because the word of God in my life changed me from the inside out. See, that's, that's the issue is that the goodness that I know that God has done in my life is based upon the word of God and his, him sending his son into my life. That's where the root of the tree finds itself to be the most nourished, the most healthy. Amen? And so, but, but I, I recognize though that God's still doing some stuff in me. And so the truth that I received yesterday was really, really good. But this is the beauty about coming into the presence of God. When you come into the presence of God, do you know that either he's still driving an old truth in or maybe he's adding something new in your life? Isn't that neat to know that God's building something new in me today? He's putting something new in my family. He's putting, and this is the thing I love about God. This is why I don't ever get tired of doing ministry. It is so powerful to watch somebody you know that you've been praying for for years get a hold of a new revelation. Isn't it neat? And it wasn't like the revelation wasn't available earlier to them because God was still putting in their life. It was just about the timing. And man, they got a hold of that thing. And it was, so, it was like one of those strokes that it may have been way up here, but they got a hold of it and it went bam, right to the core of who they were. And they were changed forever. I love watching that happen. And the thing is, is that God still does that every day. So for those that you're praying over, for those that you're praying about, don't underestimate the power of God's stroke in the right timing. Because he knows what the nail is ready for and he knows how receptive the wood is. Amen? That's why God is still dealing with your grandkids and your kids. That's why God's still performing miracles. That's why God is still speaking prophecy. Because he's still nailing truth down and doing new things. He never gets old, does he? Mm. Hallelujah. Well, let's finish with this last part here. Paul uses a phrase in verse 30 that he said that... Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That word grieve in the original Greek context truly means to cause sorrow, as in a place of mourning is what that word means. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit to cause mourning for the Holy Spirit. And again, the mourning is a phrase that we would absolutely use when something has died or someone has died. And I think about the power of the conversation that, that God has given us words that, that if they do not be used in the right season, they will die upon the vine. And, and so the whole thing about the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, by the way, amen? He's, he's not an it. He's an actual person that's a part of the Trinity. And the Word of God says that we have to be careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit, not to cause the Holy Spirit to mourn, over something that is dying or something that is dead. This is why it's so important that we keep the Word of God that is alive and active in our lives. This is why it's so important that if God puts a word on your tongue, that you take the time and the sensitivity to be able to speak that word in season and out of season because of the life that you might change. One thing that I really pledge to do moving through my 50s now, as one of my daughters said that I'm on the downhill slope now, um, <clears throat> still really praying about that anyway but one of the things that I've really pledged to do as I'm in my 50s now is to be able to spend more time with my family cultivating how much I love them 
One thing that I want to be able to do that, that is so important to me is be more in the moment. Not worrying about what I have to do next, but be more in the moment. And in the moment, asking the Lord God, Father, what would you want to say out of these lips as your child, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me, God, what do you want to say out of this vessel into that vessel that will change and affect their life forever long after I'm gone? See, I, I want to change the generation, not just by how I live and how I feel about them, but what I speak over them and what I speak into them. This is how you grow something. It's by what you speak into them. That's how I, that's how I grow. Mm, forgive me. That's how the Lord would grow each other. I think about the responsibilities that I have with my wife, and I love my wife. I love the opportunity to be able to speak into my wife. Not just what I feel about her, but about what the Word of God says about her. Because that takes root. Amen? Because the soil is fresh. The soil is ready. And I want to be able to say this to you, body of Christ. The soil is hungry in people's lives to receive the Word of truth. We have to take time to cultivate the relationship. Because unlike the analogy of the nail and the 6x6 six six and, the, and, the, and the hammer... Many times it's about planting fruit, amen? And many times it's about getting your hands dirty in somebody else's life to be able to pull back the soil and get past the dryness and get back to where the rich soil is that is just begging for a seed of life to be able to begin to grow in a place that had nothing previously to that. I love the Word of God because when it's planted in a soil that receives it, it always promises that it will grow, amen? <sighs> Hallelujah. So sometimes, as the Paul, sometimes we water, sometimes we, we reap, sometimes, whatever, but, but we're all in this process of planting truth as children in each other's lives. 